Welcome everybody. We're back again with Interchange. The first episode of 2021. And today we are going to be discussing a wonderful sort of topic. Alexandra? So today's topic, the title is actually quite interesting because it's called Anti-Gravity. And we're gonna talk about it a bit more. So just hold on, a bit of suspense. It's, it's anti-gravity. You, 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 it's really something that you wouldn't expect, but we're gonna get to it later. Hmm. But as an engineer, I have to say that I'm really excited about that topic, just because all of us like frictionless environments. But um, to go ahead and get started, let's talk briefly about what interchange is, why it happens. The whole idea came about because I wanted to reach out early in the pandemic and connect to people who were making changes in the world, making a difference in the world. And I happened to find uh, a young global change maker named Alexandra. And we had a quick chat and we found that our goals and perspectives aligned. Get, get back on camera. You're, you gotta I'm stay here. right here. I'm if here. I gotta I'm be here. here, this is good I'm stuff. Here. So we had a wonderful meeting of the minds and a connection that allowed us to start theorizing ways to use education and sustainability and engineering and soft skills and lifelong learning to make a larger impact and to make a network of connection, which is what Interchange is about. So while our backgrounds are different and while our geographic locations are different, me coming from California originally, now living in Finland, Miss Alexandra, having roots in Greece and living in Lebanon, we know that there are always possibilities, especially during time of lockdown, we have the technology to reach out. So let's connect. Would you like to talk a little bit more about our wonderful anti-gravity topic? Okay, so, you know, the last episode that we had in 2020, we talked about change and how change has been affecting us in ways we never thought that it would and how a single event spread across the globe really managed to, to I don't know, to wreak havoc in our lives. Um, and we talked about how things are interconnected. So how one element, be it negative or positive, in one area can affect other elements in other areas and therefore sort of amplify um, whatever negative or positive initial action was involved. Today, we will go a bit more hands-on with how really tangibly in the real world and in the digital world as well, a group of young people can manage to do something different, to create a change, to affect the circumstances in which we live. Because truth is, there is no such thing as going back to normalcy. Change is now the new norm. Things happen, sometimes bad things happen. And that's actually a, a statement that we laugh about a lot in, in Lebanon for other reasons, but that's not the topic of the day. So the thing is that single events can impact us in a lot of different ways. But a small group of people can impact those events in ways we never thought possible. And the example that we are going to share with you today is just that, how a small community of like-minded people, change makers in their own spaces and beyond can take matters into their own hands, which will show you how you can take matters into your own hands. Without further ado, I'd like to present today the person that we have with us. I actually met Yelena. Her name is Yelena Novikova and I actually met her in 2017 in Berlin. We were at a conference. I was representing Lebanon. She was representing Kazakhstan. We stayed in contact. And then earlier this year, actually earlier last year, why do I keep saying earlier this year? It's 2021, for goodness it's sake. Early. So last year, we sort of had a discussion and then something, a project came to being, Yelena will be talking more about it. And 
Yelena is a, is a G20 on Global Changer, both in 2017 and 2018. She has co-paneled, hear me, hear me. She has co-paneled alongside Emmy-nominated BBC Two's Philippe Cousteau Jr. and the Egyptian Minister of Water and Irrigation, Mohamed al -Ati. So she has shared quite quite a few uh, panel with quite a few interesting people. She was published at um, in the Young Global Ch as a Young Global Changer um, in this this booklet, this policy uh, making booklet that was created by the Global Solutions Foundation, uh, and she was published alongside the likes of Angela Merkel, alongside the Nobel laureate Edmund Phelps. And she was actually, she won the best paper of the year for 2019. So all of these achievements, I hope they sort of show you in very clear and exemplified terms, how much impact Yelena can have in her industry, which is ESG. And I will leave the floor to her to perhaps introduce more things about herself and to tell us a bit about that project that we're going to talk about today. Yelena? So, very nice to be here, first of all. Thank you for inviting. Uh, but I wanted to clarify, that, just so there, there's no confusion, that uh, this uh, best paper of the year, it's not connected to the day 20. Um, okay. But uh, if, if we talk about the project that we were doing, kind of early on in the pandemic, I saw a lot of personality, I saw a lot of things happening. Uh, and I knew that I'm not a public health professional. So I knew that like as a public health professional, I cannot potentially uh, kind of uh, affect people and give advice and anything like that. And um, while I was reading a lot about this topic, I was thinking, uh, it's not my place to say anything, but then how do you not say anything when you see actually people doing the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing, not just for themselves, doing the wrong thing, not just for me, but the, for the whole society. So I started kind of thinking, okay, what can I bring from my perspective that I'm clarified to talk about that I could kind of embed the message of uh, what's right in it, but not kind of overstepping in the shoes of public health, public health professionals. Um, and for me, I was starting uh, to talk about uh, public health from public management uh, perspective. And then from ESG perspective, I was also talking about it, but then I started noticing within many different change maker communities, but uh, also uh, in particular J20 change maker community, J J20 young global changers. And I realized that in their own kind of ways, everybody is kind of doing it. Uh, Alexandra was doing it, and there was another girl, uh, Lina Zdruli, who was kind of the first that I also kind of noticed that she was doing it very early on. And then Adita Kulkami as well. Uh, so a lot of people were kind of, I was seeing that they are from very different countries, from very different industries, but they were kind of having the same, uh, maybe move inside of them to do something, whatever they could. And by the time this exchange of power happened on, on Twitter, I was actually thinking in my own mind, like how, do, how can we link up and how can we kind of catalyze this moment that we are doing individually into something that is happening together. So when I actually saw that you are having the same thoughts, it was, it was kind of a cathartic moment. And I was like, if on my own, I, yeah, if on my own, I would be kind of uh, hesitant to kind of message you and say, do you want to do something about it? Or to message any of those people that 
like you reaching out on Twitter, it was kind of the moment, okay, I'm not the only one who's feeling it, like Alexander is also feeling it, not just on personal level, but on a community scale, because it's one thing to address something on an individual level, but then the next level is community level. And just like that, with this one Twitter thread, we moved from individual level to community level. And the next level, I suppose, is like this international level that we are doing right now, because the stream is happening between three countries. So it's, it's a natural progression of individual passion into something that is larger than one person. Did you notice what she said? It started in a Twitter thread. Sometimes all it takes to create change, to show change, to catalyze change is a Twitter thread. It could be a Facebook thread, it could be an Instagram thread, it could be a, a, a Zoom call, it could be, it could be anything. It could really literally be anything. So <laughs> once we realize, once we realize that we have these tools that are accessible to us, and once we realize that our own thinking patterns are also reflected elsewhere through other people in other thoughts, we can start to use these tools that we have that are made accessible to us to sort of do something um, differently. Paul, what do you think about all of this? It's absolutely vital to me. And it's important that we're not only making these connections individually, but we're also yeah. seeing, as Elena said, the tools that are available to us and reaching out with a service mindset, something that will benefit our communities, not just ourselves, but address the actual needs that exist. I think that that's sort of at the core of what's driving pretty much all of us to connect this way okay. and to, to start trying to make some change. And honestly, I'm just very, very honored to be with a couple of young global change makers. So thank you. No, both that's three of us. And um, yeah, I think that this is a good place for us to get started. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yelena, I, I really want to know a bit more about that idea that was shared by John Katzenbach. Uh, and it's, it's part of the study. Uh, it's part of the story. Um, so if you could tell us a bit more about the project itself, uh, how things unfolded, what happened uh, in the making of that project, and how it is connected to John Katzenba Katzenbach's, oh gosh, I have a difficult family name, I should be easily capable, I should be capable of pronouncing other people's difficult family names. Anyways, so if we can connect that, if, we, if you can connect for us the project itself and how it unfolded, and the ideas that were shared by John Katzenbach in A Critical Few. We can start with a project, actually. Perhaps it's good to start with actually the idea of John Katzenbach because it's a good gateway into what we are doing. Because essentially, unlike we that are talking about the community of young global change makers, it is not a formal organization per se, um, John Kassenbach, he talks about actually organizational culture. So his uh, main kind of uh, expertise is in organizations. And uh, his theory, the theory that we use that is called the theory of the critical view, it's talk about it uh, within the terms of organization. So, uh, and it's important to realize that uh, when we say critical view, we don't just mean critical view people. We are also meaning critical few behaviors, critical few traits. So um, at the beginning, I don't know if uh, John Kazenbach would like look at our project and say, oh, okay, right, it's, it's about critical few because he doesn't, he probably wouldn't see a formal organization. But when we were writing this thing, we approached it from the perspective of, all right, we might not be, we might be in entirely different organizations and we might be in entirely different countries but in a way right now at this moment in history it's uh, 
very kind of unusual in one way, but it's also kind of very expected and encouraged in another way, because I think we need to approach other problems in this world the way we are approaching pandemic. But in a way, right now, every one of us is a kind of member of one single organization that is trying to navigate how we, how are we dealing with this pandemic? How are we dealing with vaccines? How are we are dealing with social distancing, with spread of the virus and stuff like that. So in a way, uh, we are right now, not just young global changes, but every one of us is a part of same organization, which is why this uh, theory of the critical view applies not just to our community, also it perfectly applies to our community, but it also applies to the whole entire planet. And if you actually look at it, uh, then you would notice that, of course, there are in every and each country, as our project exemplifies, there are critical few people who are kind of without a mandate doing about this later. Uh, without a mandate doing a lot of different and important stuff and not all of them are members of the young global change community but uh, in a way it's also if you look at it you also notice that there are also critical few behaviors that are replicated from one country to another without people even realizing that like this behavior is a present and the change making behavior is one of those behaviors and there are also common traits so in a way because we are solving the same problem we are also kind of organization and we have organizational traits as a planet uh, when we are solving these problems whether we consciously realize it or not which is why it's so fun to actually apply traditional management theory and look at what's going on in the world. So that's how it's all started. But uh, I don't know, Alexandra, whether you want me to continue about uh, critical few people or you maybe want to have some segue into something else right now. Okay, so perhaps there's just one thing that I want to say is that that idea of sort of transferring components or ideas from traditional organizational management and sort of use them in a context that it, it, they weren't used before, these concepts and these tools. It's actually very interesting because the COVID-19 pandemic showed us how hyper-connected we are. Mm -hmm. And that high level of hyper-connectivity is really a sort of models how our, even our own systems, our own bodies work. And the same way there's an organization, one system with different components, highly, highly interconnected, the same, the same way our own physical body is one system of elements that are highly hyperconnected, the same thing works at a much higher and much bigger and much global level. So this is something that is really interesting. And the moment we start to think and feel and behave as interconnected parts of a whole, we understand how everything that we do can impact everything else around the world. So perhaps, Elena, what we could tell us, what you could tell us first and foremost is what does, what is the power of those critical few? What is their role in this larger whole? Uh, and perhaps this is where we can start. Um, it's interesting that uh, the initial kind of impression when you think about the critical few for a lot of people is that they start thinking about what actually is not critical for you and what John Kazenberg himself calls um, ambassadors. And it's very different be to be an ambassador of an idea because an ambassador of an idea, he kind of takes the official message and he takes it down to maybe another level communicates it to all the levels within the organization. So it would be something like uh, uh, World Health Organization's representatives, they would be ambassadors because they would be taking down the official message and communicating it to the public. But critical view is something entirely different. It's the people who might not be necessarily 
uh, empowered in, in the traditional mm -hmm. sense of the word, they may not have a traditional mandate to do uh, any of the changes that they are doing, actually. Uh, they are not given any authority to, like, they might be given some level of authority, but most of the time they are not. Uh, and they are driven by uh, their emotional intelligence. Uh, they are driven by their desire to affect something. And usually what makes them effective to affect change uh, is that they are very, because of their emotional intelligence, they are very interconnected to other people within the different organization um, structures and departments, not necessarily within their own department, because remember Kazenbach talks about it within the organizational management kind of setting, but it also applies to us because we are not, young global changes are not in the same country. So yeah. you can say that we are also not uh, in the same department, if you consider the country to be a department, or if you consider the specialties, um, kind of professional inclination of any young global changer as the department, they are not also in the same department because we are all doing different stuff. So in a way, it's about people who are interconnected uh, beyond the formal uh, and supported connectivities and who are driven not by mandate, but by personal desire, but by what they see in the world to actually affect change. And actually those people are very good by Kazenberg, because that's what Kazenberg said, are very good to actually not communicating the message from top to down, but to communicate the message from uh, down to up. So, and in, in a way, that's also what we were doing because we, when we were collecting data from our peers, we then took it to the organization that, that is kind of representing this uh, community. And now it's on their website. So we kind of, in a way, took it up with the whole community, not just um, our... I really like that concept. Honestly, that's, that's at the core of the sort of change that needs to happen for the world, is, is this idea that regardless of where we were born, regardless of the choices we've made in life, we're all connected very simply, and not just by our species, but by our common problems, by our common future, to be able to knock down those artificial borders that we've put up, whether they're economic, social, or national, and to see commonality. I think that that is absolutely at the key of being able to make something much greater than any of the existing organizations that we could be a part of. Because we do kind of have a membership in, you know, the mammals, humans, beings on planet Earth clubs first. And whether we think we're in the same club or not, COVID certainly knows we are. And uh, if we're going to start working at problems like these, we have to work together. And what's really powerful about this is that it really reshuffles the way traditional structure is, is made. Traditional structure means that change happens top down. This is what the ambassador model is about. Mm. Change making, actual, tangible change making. Uh, and remember, remember actually, Paul, when we first started our first episode, what was it about? What was our first episode about? This is why I write Communities. The ah, yes. Grassroots. 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 This is where change happens. It starts at the bottom and then goes up. But at the same time, I just wanted to add something else when you were saying, and it clicked. It's also very lateral. Exactly. So there, there are both dimensions. There's a horizontal dimension for change where people inspire other people and behavior sort of sifts through populations 
and uh, and departments and so on and so forth. And it also happens vertically and really allows that change, that seed of change to rise and actually impact and influence the overarching uh, organization structure, whatever that is. So I think this is absolutely fascinating and perhaps just for our viewers to understand a bit more about this project. Uh, so Yelena and I reached out to other young global changers. We designed a survey, we assembled those answers. From those answers, we understood what was happening. And then that resulted into an article, into a story that is now on the Young Global Changers blog and Global Solutions website. Um, Yelena, perhaps you can tell us a bit about those results, just so that our audience understands uh, how impactful a very tiny community of people can be. Um, so basically, uh, and I should say here that uh, those numbers just cover the first initial three months of the pandemic because we were kind of quick with Alexander to uh, actually produce the study and uh, analyze everything. So if we were to survey our audiences once again, uh, the numbers would probably be staggeringly different. Um, so everything that I mentioned is just uh, the numbers from the short, short period of time. And if you think about it, it's uh, very impressive, for example, that the outreach was over one million of people across the different media channels, because some of the audiences are reading articles, other audiences kind of uh, make speeches and um, stuff like that. So how many people, you know? that, therefore, What? How many people, how many young global changers? Oh, yeah, I should say that uh, only nine people out of our community of uh, YGC 17, it's just uh, the 17th generation, uh, 2017, uh, and uh, uh, so this generation is uh, 101 person, but out of this 101 person, only nine people, because people were probably very busy trying to ad address the stuff, so mm -hmm. only nine people were able to reply to, to our survey. And these numbers that we are talking about, they just reflect the, the, the impact of those nine people, not beyond of them. And the impact of those nine people within the first three months. So if you take it into the account, it's very staggering that over one million of people was reached. And it's just by writing 25 articles on different COVID related topics and by making just nine speeches. So it's uh, more than 16,000 people because some other people were not making speeches and they were not um, writing articles, but they were actually trying to fundraise for COVID-related relief. Mm. And um, so there were people who kind of uh, was, uh, were addressing by the macro level, but then there were people who were also going micro and going um, on the field and trying to do something from within the field. So if you talk about those people, it's around more than 16,000 people were affected. Um, and we actually created a ratio and the ratio was uh, almost 1,850, I think, people. So it's almost 2,000 people per one person who is doing the impact. And to be honest, I think I'm speaking for Alexandra here as well, that we didn't expect this to happen. We expected, uh, like, if you were to tell me that, okay, 25 articles were written, I would believe it because I've read all of these 25 articles. If you were to tell me that like 85 posts on social media were made, I would believe it because I read this social media post. But when you actually start to count how many reads 
a certain post get? How yeah. many of you in uh, the certain speech gets? It, it's pretty staggering. We don't realize just how much these little things add up and affect. You know, in, in Britain, they always say every little helps. But it turns out that little is not so little anymore. You know? I really like seeing those numbers. I think I think one of the main things that stops people in, in engineering or, or a lot of the sciences from digging in and really doing their best to help is the idea that, well, there's no data being collected. How do we know we're even making an impact? How do we know we're not making things worse? But being able to start crunching these numbers and gather that data is sensational. And that kind of an effect, nine, becoming at bare minimum 2000, but having, uh, having that visual impact, reaching over a three month period to over a million people, that's, that's sensational. I think, I think that's exactly what the business and marketing communities have been trying to leverage for a long time, but they can't even get that kind of reach because this is what people are driven internally to want to start addressing. That is... It's not about creating a need, it's about creating a solution. Exactly. Because the marketers are talking about, they are creating the needs, the artificial needs that, that's not there. But no. the change makers who are addressing this stuff, they are trying to create a solution to a very much existing pr problem. That's, mm -hmm. that's why it's so impactful. And this is exactly why it's necessary to be able to sort of start looking at that grassroots mobilization as a part of the outreach, as a part of the service that's being done, not just locally, but internationally. I think that that's incredible what you guys have done. I'm just, honestly, I'm kind of blown away. This is- Happy dance. Right? That is, that is the happy dance. That is... I've only just learned how to do a happy dance, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, that, that was behind the scenes. <laughs> so my question, I think that um, sort of a key question is for anyone who, who sees something like this, when they see something where they know this is what I want to be, you know, spending some of my time, you know, impacting. Maybe it's not my job, maybe it's not my specialty, but I'm young and I have energy and whether I'm going to be writing articles or making speeches or helping behind the scenes, as you said, with fundraising or what have you, whatever your, your talent and skill set are, what is it that someone needs to become effectively a young global change maker, or the sort of change maker that you've described in your study? What would, what would I, as that person, need to know to become one of the critical few? I would... I would say that, um, yes, we are talking about young global changes right now, but I would be very careful about framing it uh, within the terms of, do you need to be young to be a change maker? I and appreciate that. Because <laughs> I'm too old for it. But can be a change maker. And also, I'm not going to tell about uh, a change maker who is a part of our community, but... Uh, she actually exemplifies for me the very essence of young global changes because I know uh, one lady in London who was in her late 80s when she started her change making enterprise, social enterprise. And now she's deep into her 90s and she's still doing this enterprise. And um, she, she uh, because it, it's kind of very similar to what we see with going on with COVID. Uh, but for her, it wasn't COVID. For her, she was actually a nurse during the World War II. And she was experiencing hunger in a labor camp uh, by the end of the World War. So when she was in her late 80s slash early 90s, she realized that there is a lot of children and a lot of people going on hungry in, in the UK right now. Uh, even though there is no war, there is nothing uh, like that happening. And she went on and she created a map of London 
where she put, uh, she teamed up with some, uh, you know, IT people, and she put different uh, food businesses that were ready to donate food to local charities at the end of the day. So every local charity, church and stuff like that, uh, they could go to this map and figure out where they could get food for those in need. So why she exemplifies Young Global Change as, uh, as is for me is because she experienced something, she mm -hmm. felt something about something, and but she didn't stop with just feeling something. She went on and she said, okay, what can I do? And for me, it's, it's very parallel and very singular to what's happening with young global changes, what's happening with other people who are change makers, because it's, we are all feeling, we are, we are said to be empathetic generation, uh, whether you are a millennial or whether you are a Gen Z, but um, it's, it's not just about feeling, it's about where do you take this feeling and whether you are feeling that um, every little helps. So all you essentially need to do is just have some feelings. You don't have to be a psychopath to affect somebody. Uh, as long as you feel something, you can do it. Uh, as long as you are willing to take this feeling somewhere and you don't need to have any resources, uh, you can take it somewhere, even if it's just little impact, even if you just impact one person or two people, it's not, we, we shouldn't be uh, kind of imprisoned by, okay, are we, are we affecting a lot of people? Because it might end up that the one person who you affect is going to be the next Greta Thunberg who is going to affect later on thousands of people. So it's not about how much change you create. Also, I realized very well that our study about how much impact our community created. But uh, we shouldn't just be imprisoned by this data mentality. Yes, data is important, but it's also about the quality of impact that you're making. And if you are impacting one person, so be it. It's better than impacting no one at all. So just try something and you will, you will realize later whether it is one person or one million or maybe one billion. Um, and then also what you need to do is probably to have some critical thinking in terms of where is my skill set is best suited? Where can I do the most difference? Because if you are, I don't know, a clown and you start speaking about uh, public health, not a lot of people can listen. But if you are a clown, you can go to the hospital where kids with COVID are, and there you can maybe make some difference. So it's also about how, uh, how is my skill set is suited to what I can impact. And pretty much, I don't think you, you do need anything else at all. That's like absolutely that. wonderful. That's really, really wonderful. I'd like just to sum it up a bit and perhaps streamline the process for you guys. If you're listening to us, just pay attention. The first thing that you need to do is feel. Feel with the world, feel with those who need, feel with the community that you want to serve. The second step is understand what you can do best. So the skills that you have, the superpowers that are within you, uh, your area of expertise, uh, the, exactly, exactly, just that, just that. So understand what makes you, do that again. Can you do that again, Paul? Understand what makes you powerful and skilled and then use that and go to step three, which is taking action. Just do it, channel that feeling, channel those skills, take action, put them on the ground, do something. Because if you feel all of that and you just sit down, sit back um, and do nothing, well, guess what? Nothing will happen. 
And when that happens, the perhaps the last thing, if I do remember the entire sort of structure well, Yelena, the last thing would be quality and make sure that the action that you do, whatever action it is, even if it's a tiny action, it doesn't matter what size it is, make sure that it really carries the quality that you want it to have extra quality that really echoes the feelings, the emotions, the skills that you have, and that would effectively make an impact, even if it was just one single person, because this is what matters. And I think that would sort of summarize, and Yelena, is that correct? It, it sort of summarize, uh, summarizes? Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay, cool. But we have one last element that we just added to the process. Uh, so, Yelena, it's a surprise for you. It's mm -hmm. a last series of questions, and we called them the... Rapid Seven. Okay. So, because... we're going to ask some very quick, simple questions and just give a simple one-word, in most cases, answer. And we're just going to alternate back and forth, firing them at you. Are you ready? Okay, yes. Excellent. Describe the future in one word. Aspirational. Describe the present in one word. Uh, hmm. Challenging, but not in a way, not in a negative way. Just one word. Challenging is good. Challenging. Describe your state of mind in one word. Uh, change maker. Mm, nice. Um, Yelena, summer or winter? Summer, definitely summer because I've spent a lot of my life in 40 de minus degrees winters. Thank you very much. I don't want that. <laughs> right. Well, I'll find a tropical island somewhere. This is, this is the way to go. Coffee or tea? Coffee, definitely coffee, always a lot of coffee. Um, Yelena, what's your favorite word? That's impact. Let's go for impact. All right. And an inspirational message or advice, no more than five words. Huh. Hmm, it's six words, but lead from where you stand. I like it. That is a powerful one. That is a powerful one. Yelena, um, thank you so much for being here with us. It was an absolutely brilliant discussion. Uh, and it really complements the previous episode that we had about change making and systems thinking. And it really shows you how you really don't need to complicate things. You just follow these four step process, feeling, skill, action, quality, and that's that. And you can make an impact that you never ever thought you could make. When, when we did this study, we never expected that we could possibly see on one hand, nine individuals, and on the other hand, more than 16,000 people directly impacted and more than a million in outreach. We, we never expected to have those numbers. The only way they can have them is just do it. Okay, and we should actually, I don't know if you can remember it, but you probably do when when we just received nine replies without looking at them. We were kind of disappointed because we thought that there would be no data in there from nine people. And then when we opened it and started uh, actually counting it, we were like absolutely out of this world surprise. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. this is another key factor, is to remember not to judge the quality or the, the impact of the work that you're doing as mm -hmm. you're doing it. That doesn't matter. But if you're really worried, then gather some actual data. I mean, actually looking and celebrating those small successes can be huge for your own motivation and can be huge to show anyone who's naysaying exactly what's being done. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how big the impact is personally, but it can make every bit of difference 
to even one person. And if it matters to one other person, then everything that you've done is worth that time and energy. So that is, I am absolutely blown away by the work that you guys did. And you have an entire article going uh, about the numbers, about the details of this process, correct? Yes. Excellent. We'll make sure that we have that. Uh, on the Global Solutions website. Perfect. We'll make sure we also have a link to that in the, um, in the video comments as well, so that people can go there and check it out and absolutely get started with their own changes, because there's nothing to stop any of us except ourselves. True. And, well, we... We are the only people who can stop us ourselves, and we are the only people who can create the change that we want and transform the negative into positive and do all the things that we care about, that we want to do, that we want to achieve in order to just make that change. We, we, we realize, I think 2020 and now the beginning of 2021, we, we are coming to realize, if we haven't realized yet, that things can no longer stay as they are. Mm. And the only way to change them is to act upon it, even at a smaller scale. And I hope that these amazing insights that Yelena has shared with us, inspired by John Katzenbach's A Critical Few, I hope that this would sort of convince you and sort of allow you to feel that you have power within you and that you can use that power in order to do the things that you want to do and make the changes that you want to make, even on a small scale, you will be astonished at the compound impact that you and many other people like you would be able to make. So guys, this was uh, the sixth episode of the Interchange uh, series. We're going to see you again next month, the last on the last Wednesday of the month with another speaker, this time it would be a speaker from the UK. Uh, I cannot wait to, to share again some, some disruptive uh, information and some disruptive ideas. Um, Yelena, thank you so, so much for being here with us today. It was absolutely wonderful. I think a lot of people have benefited from those insights from those uh, moments of inspiration that you have shared with us. Thank you for inviting. An absolute pleasure. Go and do good, everyone. And we will see you again next time on Interchange. <laughs>